Hi, I'm Angie Wright Reeves, and welcome to Law and Society. Today on the program, we're talking about wills, trust, and estates with Steve Worrell with Georgia Estate Plan. Steve, a real pleasure to have you back. It's been a while. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's a very timely topic, and all oh, I know my family, we're going through something uh, right now dealing mm. with like my dad's estate right. and all of that, and I hadn't really realized, even though I practice law, that it's a very complicated area. It's not very simple. And I think for a lot of people, they think that you need to have a lot of money mm -hmm. to even be concerned about this area. So can you just give us an overview when we're talking about planning with wills, estates, trust, all of that, mm -hmm. it's really, we're talking about, I guess, conveying property, right. protecting our family, mm -hmm. like what are the considerations Sure. Well, first of all, the myth that you mentioned that you have to have an, a vast estate to plan for your estate is absolutely wrong. Uh, every adult needs a basic comprehensive estate plan, which at the minimum would include, for most people, at least a will, possibly a living trust. We can talk about what those are. Mm -hmm. uh, a health care directive, so they can make their choices about what sort of care they want to receive if they're in an end-of-life situation, uh, and to nominate someone to make their choices for them if they can't and then a comprehensive financial power of attorney that would uh, appoint someone to handle their legal, financial, and business transactions. So let's just back up real quickly. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about your estate, mm -hmm. what is your estate? Sure. Well, your estate is basically everything you own. And there are different parts of your estate that are going to be handled differently at the time of your death. Um, a lot of people think that their will controls everything, if they have a will. Uh, it doesn't. It does not control jointly owned property, like a joint bank account. It doesn't control life insurance or retirement accounts that have beneficiaries designated. Those are contracts that you have with those companies to provide those funds at the time of your death. Um, so that's not part of your probate estate, but it's part of your overall estate. So basically anything you own, whether it's money, whether it's real estate, whether it's uh, these days cryptocurrency or other digital mm -hmm. assets, your pets, your personal property, your, your, the things in your house that you can walk around and touch, all of that is part of your estate. Right. And we don't have to talk about having like a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, you know, something that means something to you. Absolutely. So when we're talking about estates, there's also that emotional mm -hmm. Uh, element as well. Right. I mean, for you to be able to designate things that mean something to mm -hmm. you to specific people. I mean, to make sure that your wishes are carried Absolutely. out. Absolutely, because if you don't do that, the state is going to come in with its plan. And I can tell you, nine, nine times out of ten, most people I talk with about the state's plan for what's called intestacy, that's what it's called if you don't have a will. Uh, they say, that's not the plan I want, but that's the plan that the legislature has said, well, we assume everybody wants this plan. Right. So if you have a, most, you know, if you have a spouse only, that's, that's generally about the, the extent of the time it works. I want everything going to my spouse. Okay, great. But what if you have a spouse and, say, two children? Well, the spouse gets a child's portion, so the spouse will get a third, and the children will take the other two-thirds. You may not want that. You may say, I want everything going to my spouse to my first spouse, right. if she survives me, and then if she doesn't, then to my children. Right. But that's not what the state's plan is. Right. And then there are, like, the complications. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of people uh, marry and then yes. separate and never divorce. Yes. And it could be 20 years mm -hmm. since you've seen this person and you hate them with every mm -hmm. fiber of your soul, but they are legally your spouse. Yes. So if you die, mm -hmm. then they have the right to determine what's happening with your stuff, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. They are the, they're the chosen person. If you don't have a will to be your administrator, you're generally the first in the list. Uh, you can name someone else in a will to, to handle your estate, but that's, again, that's where you're planning the things instead of letting the state control things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get into, like, the particulars mm -hmm. of the different instruments that you sure. were talking about. Now, you mentioned uh, will, mm -hmm. a trust. Right. You mentioned... Healthcare directive. Healthcare directive. Mm -hmm. And a power of attorney. Okay, so let's talk about the different ones. Sure, rules. okay. Well, a will is a document where you are naming who is to be in charge of your estate when you die, who, who, who gets your things when you die, and if you have a minor child, then who is going to be the guardian? You have the, the opportunity to nominate people to be your guardian for your child's guardian. Um, so that's what a will does. A living trust can do something better than a will in a couple of ways. 
A will will not avoid probate. A lot of my clients say, well, we want to avoid probate. Well, and you ask them why do they want to pro well, avoid probate, they'll say, well, I just heard that's what you're supposed to do. And I'll say a lot of people in, in Georgia do not realize that probate system is friendlier, easier, simpler than in a lot of other states, but it's still something that a lot of people want to avoid. Yeah, it seems complicated. It's, it's public. It is complicated, especially, yeah. you know, I've seen plenty of people try to do it themselves without the, the assistance of a right. lawyer, and they, they usually end up getting prob a lot of problems when that happens. But it's a public process. It takes an artificially long time. We're, the law is set up to protect creditors, and mm -hmm. so we have this time frame that the creditors get to submit their claims and get paid before anybody else does in your, right. in your lo in, of your loved ones. So we can avoid that with a living trust. It avoids the death side of probate by having a separate legal entity called your trust own your assets. You transfer your house to it, your personal property, your bank accounts, your financial accounts. You can even designate it as the beneficiary of your retirement and your life insurance policies. And then at your death, you don't own anything in, in your name. And that's what probate is. What, is. what is the process that your stuff in your own name, individual name, has to go through when you die? So a living trust can avoid that because this other entity that you've created that you have set up other rules for, that you have named the backup people to, t to be in charge of these assets after you die, or if you become incapacitated. We can avoid a second time of probate that way, called guardianship or conservatorship. If you have a disability panel in your trust and you have disability provisions as to how your money is to be used while you're disabled, uh, we can avoid that type of, of probate as well. And then a third type that we can avoid with living trust is something called ancillary probate where if you own real estate in another state, when you die, there's potentially more, multiple probates that are going to happen, one here where you live and one in the state where the property is. If you have a living trust that owns that property in the other state, then your trustee is in charge of that and can do all of that without probate. Well, let's pre present the scenario sure. from in, in the typical, a typical person mm -hmm. who may pass away. They have, like, a house. Mm -hmm. They have... Mm, you know, maybe a little bit of money in the bank right. and, and all, and, you know, maybe um, a vacation home mm -hmm. or something, but not, not a whole lot of stuff. Right. I mean, this seems like a lot of work, <laughs> <laughs> setting up a trust it is. for just th those things and all. Does that make any sense it, to do when you're talking about, you know, just your average, typical person, you know? Well, in the situation you described, if that real estate, the vacation home is out of, out of state of Georgia, then it, it could make sense because you're looking at potentially your family having to go through two probates when you die. Uh, it is a lot of work up front with a trust. You're, you're doing a lot of the work that would otherwise be done after you're gone, but you're doing it so that uh, you're not putting it on the responsibility of it on your family after you're gone. So, so it, it can make sense. Better just to just put the houses in like your spouse's name. I mean, doesn't that avoid everything? And then like with your money, I, I, like we didn't discuss like pay mm -hmm. on death, try and right. get everything sure. a, as much as possible paid on death, you know, designate it like that. Those are good techniques. They're not foolproof. Um, uh, payable on death is a better way than putting someone on a bank account, in my opinion, because a lot of times I deal with a lot of elderly clients that they come to me and say, well, I put my daughter on, the account, on my checking account uh, for convenience so that she can write my bills, she can, uh, and, if I, and when I go, she'll have the money to pay my funeral and those sorts of things. Well, let's imagine that the daughter is going through a divorce. Uh, all of a sudden, that account has her, has her name on it, and her mm -hmm. husband in discovery and divorce is going to say, tell me every account that has your name on it. Mm -hmm. And that is a potential asset that could be divided by the court in a divorce case, or at least some other asset of equal value could be taken from her to equitably divide that property. So there's one potential problem with that. Payable on death is a beneficiary designation that a lot of banks have added those. Uh, it's very similar to what happens with your life insurance or your retirement. Those are all beneficiary assets. And even brokers now are offering what are called TOD, transfer on death uh, options, where you can name a beneficiary of your investment accounts. And those are good ways to avoid probate. So those are, those are some alternatives. Uh, that people can look at. Um, but with the trust, you are in control of how that money is going to be, going to be used. When your joint owner of that account receives it, there's no, no strings, no controls. And that's perfectly fine for a lot of my clients. They say, I don't want to control things from the grave. But there are, th there are times where, okay, my client, or my, my, my daughter is going through a divorce. My client is a, uh, excuse me, my daughter is a frivolous spender. Uh, my daughter has a lot of credit card bills. My daughter has a bad, has a big judgment against her. 
all of those things, when that money goes to her, is going to go right out the door to all those different creditors and predators. Yeah, okay. When you set up the trust, mm -hmm. though, it, does the trust last forever? Or, you know, that money, the property, all of that just sits in the trust uh, forever? Or, or what? I mean, like, it seems like with the will, there's finality. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I give you this. I give this person that, right. I give this person that, mm, done. Uh, I mean, a trust, like, is it the same sort of finality or not with it? I mean, it depends on the rules of the trust, but generally, yes. I mean, there's going to be some time frame where the last dollar is going to be spent and, and given out to a beneficiary. I can give you an example of, a, of an estate that was based on a will that's still going on today, Elvis Presley. Uh, mm. His estate is still open, and uh, the money that's coming into the estate every year is, is uh, managed by that estate. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't necessarily end. Uh, there are some rules on how long a trust can last. Uh, th those rules, rules were recently extended in Georgia from uh, 21 years to 360 years in certain cases. but. Uh, Typically, you're not dealing with dynasty trusts. That's what those are called when they go on forever and ever like that. Where you yeah, I just had this pop into my head uh -huh. from law school, the rule against perpetuity. Right. <laughs> and, uh -huh. and that was like in my wills class. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me what it means or anything. It's just a really nice term, the rule against uh, perpetuity. It basically means what you were just suggesting. Right. That things need to have an ending time. They need to have and, an ending. And that's what, that's, that's what that rule does. But generally speaking, most of my clients don't have what are called dynasty trusts. They, they provide for their children, potentially for the grandchildren, and, and there's, there's a definite ending date in the, in the documents. I, I call estate planning um, you know, what you do for the people you love and the things you care about. And wow, so, uh, that's exactly true. If you, want to, you know, if you want to benefit the people you love in the ways that you want to benefit them uh, and take care of the property, the things that you care about the way that you want to, then you need an estate plan. Now, is there like an ideal time mm -hmm. that you should start thinking about this? You know, I know a lot of people who are maybe in their 20s or 30s, mm -hmm. they think, eh, you know, I've got a long time right. to even think about dying and all. <laughs> of course. And then maybe like when you're like in your 70s or 80s, you're thinking, I don't have any young mm -hmm. kids to even worry about or whatever right. and all. So I, well, what's the ideal time to start? Honestly, the ideal time, at least for cer certain things, is at 18. When you become 18, you go off to college, your parents no longer have any control over you or your, your money or your property, and you may not be to the, developed to the point where you have good control over those things or know even what to do with those things. So uh, we have a, an annual campaign right before school starts every fall to make sure parents uh, have their kids name legal name, name them as their uh, health care agents under a health care directive and a, uh, an agent under a power of attorney so they can help them with those legal financial and business things. Uh, they may not need a will just yet. That may come later, but if they have uh, online gaming <laughs> that's important to them or Facebook accounts and all those pictures they keep on there, those may be things that you want to designate someone to be able to take care of. If you have, once you have children, once you have a baby, um, you need to name guardians for that child. So that okay, so let's see, 18, sure. mm -hmm. we're talking about taking care of your health right. kind of thing, right. having somebody do that. Yes. So now we're moving to your 20s mm -hmm. and you have a career. Mm -hmm. So what do you need then? Well, you have a career. Um, not married yet. Not married no yet. Children. Really mm -hmm. the same things then. You, you are more responsible for your own things and you can change those initial determinations of who's going to be in charge of those things if you have a life partner or a spouse at that point. But um, you still need someone to be in charge of your health care decisions so if you can. So that's the medical directive? That would be the what medical directive, okay. health care directive. Okay. And the uh, financial power of attorney, so that if, okay. if you needed someone to help you with financial, legal, or business transactions, at this point, maybe you're more sophisticated, you can handle them yourself, but what if you became incapacitated? That's the thing about most people don't think about estate planning as dealing right. with what happens while you're alive. They do. So the medical directive mm -hmm. will do the health take care of like decisions regarding mm -hmm. your health. Right. Now, w if you're in the hospital and mm -hmm. you're incapacitated, right. so you can't take care of your financial stuff, mm -hmm. then that's a different instrument that, that you have? That's called a financial power of attorney, and okay. you are naming an agent to help you with those things and uh, uh, to ta handle those things for you if you can't or if you just need some help in handling them. You, you're not giving up those rights. You're just you're delegating them to someone else to ha exercise for you. Yeah, and, and people need to recognize, you know, because I think a lot of people um, are 
hesitant because they think that they're giving control mm -hmm. over right. and so it can be abused but uh, it's not triggered mm -hmm. until you're actually incapacitated. It just doesn't, they just don't have it, period. You have to, it's triggered by something, right? It can be. It, it, it can be made effective immediately. Uh, and for my kids that are going off, you know, for my clients that have kids going off for college, I generally rec recommend that we make it effective immediately. They can make it effective in the event of incapacity, and then we have to define how that incapacity is to be determined, whether one doctor signs a certificate or two doctors or whatever. Um, but yes, you can you control that in terms of what the triggering event is, what the contingency is. Okay. All right. So that's our twenty. Mm -hmm. So those two right. things are most important. Mm -hmm. Now we're moving into having a family. Right. We've got like a couple of kids, mm -hmm. and we're married. Right. And we have our first home that mm -hmm. we bought, and all of that. Right. In our thirties and forties, what instruments do you need? Is that when you need to start thinking about having a will or yes. a trust or something like that? A will what? definitely, at the very least, because that is the instrument in Georgia where we designate guardians, and so. You want to say, who is going to take care of my children if neither of the parents are alive? I mean, if one parent is alive, they're going to, they're going to have the children. So and that, that needs to be in the will. And that's true right. even in the event of a divorce. You okay. know, that, uh, but yes, the, the guardianship nomination is typically done in a will. And uh, you name, ideally, a, a set of backups. You know, who's going to be your first choice for guardian? Who's going to be your second choice? Possibly even a third choice. You also should even consider whether or not to name temporary guardians, to t someone that can take care of the children, because guardianship is a court process. It takes some time. Who's going to take care of the children in the meantime, as opposed to having defects get involved in possible foster care? We don't want that. Nobody wants that. So if you can name those people in your documents that are going to be responsible for those decisions if you were gone and can't make them any longer, then that's, um, that should be done in a will. Uh, a trust at that point. Once you start getting, uh, there's really no magic number as far as I'm concerned, as far as when a trust is a good idea, but typically my clients that have net worths, including retirement and life insurance of over $2 million, that's where we start talking. Those are the clients that most often look at having a trust. Okay, so before, if you're under, mm -hmm. if you're, all of your assets are worth say under two mm -hmm. million, then a will is the best way to divide will is fine. Your, yeah, as long as they, yes, your so property. A will is perfectly fine. Again, keep in mind probate is a process that some people want to avoid because it takes a long time. They're, they may have to do an extra process to get money to their children or to, to their minor children or to their spouse um, outside of the will. Uh, Otherwise, as that's an extra press st step that has to be involved, an extra procedure that's involved, extra cost, extra delay. But you know, to, we have to pay those creditors first. And so for four to seven months after you open an estate, you can't distribute money to your spouse or to your children. That has to be held out for the, for the creditors first. Now, what about you're in a special circumstance where mm -hmm. you have maybe a child with special needs right. or or something and you're wondering like how do I ensure mm -hmm. that they will be taken care of once okay. my husband and I you know no longer here and so what's the best way to do that great question if you typically uh, I deal with a lot of clients that have spe have children with special needs and a lot of them are on some sort of government needs based program such as Medicaid or SSI a, an inheritance to that child is going to kick them right off of those government benefits because mm -hmm. they're, they're going to have more resources than the, the law allows them to have. So the best way to deal with those is to create a trust, either separately or in a will, that, that uh, would pay money to them through a trust. Basically, it names someone as a trustee to manage that money for them and spend it on their needs. So it never comes into the control of the child with special needs. Mm -hmm. If it's not in the, in the child's control, then it's not an asset that they are going to get disqualified for. Now, I keep hearing people talk about, and we talked a little bit mm -hmm. about this, about like trying to get rid of as much property as you can mm -hmm. before you die. <laughs> so you don't really have anything. Right, right. Do, what, why are people saying that? What is the benefit of not having anything? Well, uh, or trying to get rid of it. Before usually, you people die. that are in that situation, trying to get rid of things, uh, are often dealing with long-term care issues, and and often have no exp no source to pay for those long-term care expenses except for their assets, and they don't really have any choice but spend every dollar down to get down to the Medicaid requirements, mm. which is for a single person two thousand dollars of assets. Uh, if you're married, the, you can protect up to one hundred and thirty-two thousand dollars or so. Um, 
And so that's, that's the goal, that there are countable assets, there are non-countable assets. And so you have to get your countable assets down to these levels. But the trick is the, the rules of Medicaid allow you to convert what is countable to non-countable, and so you can protect some assets that way and be, have, be able to have some money to supplement your needs in a, in a nursing home, to, uh, to have someone be able to, to pay for your things that you need outside of, the, uh, uh, of your own assets. Now, with uh, actually writing these instruments, do mm -hmm. you need an attorney? Do you need an attorney to make a will? Because I've heard, you know, you can write it on a piece of paper, <laughs> you know, and just sign it and have somebody witness it. I want Jimmy Green to have my, you know, 1959 Cadillac mm -hmm. or something and then sign it and have it witnessed, and that's good. You can do that. I can tell you as an experienced estate planning and probate attorney that uh, I've seen more often than not, usually, and let's just say 98% of the, of the do-it-yourself wills that I've seen, whether they've written them themselves or go to an online company, um, they have something wrong with them. And so it, it, again, slows the process down, costs more money to their family that they, that they could have otherwise have been receiving right from the estate if the things had been done correctly. Yes, you can do it correctly. Yes, you can write your own will as long as it complies with the legal requirements in Georgia. Now, can you do the other, pay, would a trust, does that involve an attorney always, the other, the health care directives, the financial directives, all of those, do they involve attorneys or can you do it yourself? Is they it do don't, it yourself? They don't have to uh, have attorneys for all of those. I would say a trust is a very com complicated or complex instrument, so I would not recommend that to be done on your own. Uh, the health care directive in Georgia is a statutory form. You can go online and download it from a variety of sources and fill it out yourself. You may not understand everything about it. It's good to have an attorney to kind of counsel you and advise you about your choices. Same thing with the financial power of attorney. It's a statutory form. Since 2017, we we've, have a brand new statutory power of attorney form that for the first time in Georgia history, banks and other third parties that you present it to are required to accept it. They cannot give you excuses like they used to. It's too old or it's not our form. But uh, So now you have to follow that form. So those are things that people can do themselves. So are these the same things, the health care directives, mm -hmm. that they give you like in the hospital? Most of the time or, they do. All? Because my mother was just so freaked out, mm -hmm. and maybe other people as well, when they offer you these sure. forms and say, you know, do you want to be, because they have you know, very specific mm -hmm. sorts of things. Do you want sure. to be intubated right. or all of this other stuff? Scary, scary words. Yes. And I know my mother was freaked out and she just like, you know, no, I'm not signing this or right. filling it out or anything like that. Right. You know, I, I don't think she thought they were going to harvest her, <laughs> you know, <laughs> organs or right. anything. But, you know, it can be scary. Sure, absolutely. And it's, it's a, a difficult conversation to have even in an attorney's office. But it's important that you understand what your choices are so you can make the informed decisions and make the choices by initialing the proper things. You can leave everything blank in a health care directive and just name the people and let them make those decisions ah, for you. For you. So they Somebody ever tells, tells you that? No, yeah. no. No, but if you name your health care agents, um, you know, typically one, two, three, they are allowed to make those decisions if you don't take the certain powers away from them, either by initialing or not initialing, depending on what the uh, form provides. Now, the interesting thing is, is that you may think uh, that you're giving control away when you're doing this, mm -hmm. but actually you're taking control. Mm -hmm. You're taking control of your assets. You're taking control of taking care of your family. You're taking, ca taking control of how you want your health care to be mm -hmm. given, right. all of that. So it really is not losing control. Mm -hmm. You're actually taking control. Right. Keep in mind that you're not always going to be in, able to, to voice your, your choices and concerns. Right. So the idea of putting them down on paper before the need is there is a good thing for you. It's a good thing for your family. So they don't have to wonder about what those choices should be. Okay. So last minute, adv just general advice to mm -hmm. people. What do you need to do right now when you stop watching this program? <laughs> and you get off and hopefully you've learned something, right. what do people need to do? Well, I would recommend that they consult with a, uh, a competent and licensed estate planning attorney who has some experience in the field. A lot of people just, you know, do wills, uh, they type off of their word processor. Uh, we don't like to do that. We do a, uh, a very customized plan for the client. We sit down and, and identify their goals and concerns. We draft a document that meets those goals and concerns and put those plans in place. And we make sure that they're kept up to date. That's an important thing, too. That you, the document you made 20 years ago may not be effective 
may not be, it, it may still be legally enforceable, but it may not be what you want today. We recommend that you don't put them in a safe deposit box because at the moment of someone's death, that box is supposed to get sealed and you have to go to probate court to get an order to get out, things out of it. So we recommend that you keep it in a fireproof, waterproof safe at your home and that you know that your people that you've chosen, your executors, your other family members know where to find it, how to access it and get, the, you know, get that safe open or uh, what the combination is and that sort of thing. All right. Well, we got to get out of here, Steve. Right. It's been a real pleasure. It's been great. Uh, quickly, how do people get in contact with you? I am at uh, Georgia Estate Plan uh, in Marietta. Our website is georgiaestateplan.com. Our phone number is 770-425-6060. All right. Pleasure. Thank you. I made you right.